The world is not focused day in, day out on these stories. Countries. We round to the nearest million on illegals. Millions? If we don't have a sensible policy about this, this century is going to be a real problem. I want to ask you a question. Please. Do you think your establishment... And I'll explain to you why I don't think I'm established. Not to pull up data because nobody collects that data. If I was to pull up... America is the most important country in the world. Strategy on this. This is an episode you won't want to miss. So let's get right into it. Right in Britain. So one... It's a very good question. The the issue of um, that I, I touched on there. There were these riots recently in Britain, which I um, yep. I predicted for many many years would happen. Um, one of the reasons they happen. There are lots of reasons. One is that Britain, like America, has lost control of its borders, and uh, on top of that, legal migration in the UK is at a historic high. Legal net migration. It, you just to give some historic context. In the 1990s. The legal net migration per year was in the tens of thousands. Um, when the Conservative government left office earlier this year, it was at three quarters of a million, um, plus tens of thousands of people coming illegally on boats and through other means, um, possibly in the hundreds of thousands, that yep. one as well. The, I mean, I've written about this a lot in the past. I wrote in my book, The Strange Death of Europe in 2017, about the the integration challenges, the, the the cultural challenges that come when you have migration at this kind of speed. Um, but th- th- what you mentioned there, the piece I wrote in The Spectator and also in the New York Post about that, was um, people tend to find that the easiest bit to talk about in a way is the illegal migration. But what I was showing in that piece was that even if you take the legal migration in a country like Britain, which is very similar to all other Western European countries, benefit that's very clear to the government. Because the migrants, of course, do add. They add financially, but not in the ways that everybody thinks. So in this particular case, the government can say, we've added X number of jobs into the workforce. But what they don't say is most of them have gone to people who were not born here. It's and, and my view is it kind of breaks one of the pacts between the electorate and the elected, which is that the electorate vote generally for something they think will make their lives better. They don't vote for something to make the lives of people who don't yet live in the country better. Mm-hmm. And so one of the points I've made for many years about this is if you if you grow the pie, but you give the pie to people who haven't been there for the baking, as it were, you break part of the pact. And the British electorate are pretty mad about this subject. And some of them, as they showed last month, are very mad indeed about it. Um, I think that's a perfectly, it's, it's a problem that's perfectly possible to deal with. There's no reason why a country like Britain or America cannot have a migration, an immigration system that brings in, you know, talented people who are not going to be any kind of burden on the welfare state and for whom the benefit of their migration doesn't just accrue to them. And that's one of the other things in this area that's very important is is that the benefit of the migration largely accrues to the migrant, not to the society in terms of the of, of the finance. The benefit? I think they do, actually. I think you can fall into it from habit. Um, there are lots of things that can make you feel better in the short term as people that are just not good for us, mm-hmm. but they can make you feel better. Mm-hmm. I mean, if... if if you'd laced my coffee with cocaine or MDMA, I would feel better. But it wouldn't be good for me. Well, I wouldn't drink it if I were you, because that's what they told me they were doing that, to make you fired up. So just be careful with that. I should, yeah. I should, but it was a little bit, so it shouldn't be too much of it. Um, but th- there are lots of things in the short term could make you feel better, but are not good for you long term. Mass migration like that can make you feel better in the short term. As I say, it does grow the pie a little bit. It's just that people don't get a share in it. And um, the problem with the migration question, this is a problem that, that the Republicans will have to deal with here if they win in November, um, is that none of the answers to this are easy. I mean, again, it's, 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 it's like a drug. It's, it's, it's very easy to get into and quite hard to get off. In fact, very hard to get off. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a country I know pretty well. Uh, they had several years ago an election in which the main conservative running said that he was going to deport the one million illegals, which was estimated there were in Italy. I was never clear, even if he won the election, how he could do that. How on earth do you deport a million people? Let alone. Not... I have asked politicians in this country exactly the same question. How exactly do you do that? I mean, the government in America, like everywhere, is is not that great at doing 
a lot of things. How on earth would you pull something like that off? My point is, is that when it comes to the issue of migration, what actually happens is it's just so hard to fix after you've opened the door that basically nobody does. I don't yet know of a Western country that has lost control of its immigration like America has or like Britain has that has any idea of how to correct it. And I'm not, I'm not against immigration per se. I, think I'm, I, I believe that a society should have a say in immigration policy. Allow talented people in, allow a certain number of people in for humanitarian reasons, uh, in, in exceptional circumstances. This, this benefits the society, but it doesn't benefit it if instead of being a sort of trickle of a tributary into the society as a whole, it's a flood. Uh, which you then can't do anything about. I, 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 the reason, I mean, I, I haven't written about this that much since The Strange Death of Europe. One reason was that I had said almost everything I could say about it by t- in terms of warning. And although a lot of politicians in America and Europe read the book, um, I was under the impression that they didn't know what to do about it. One politician said to me um, in on the continent in Europe, uh, this is a very depressing book for me to read. Mm-hmm. I said, you should have tried writing it. Um, these, these are really big problems in the 21st century. And, and as you know, they're made particularly big, not just by the inability of Western leaders to do anything about it, but by the fact that... You know, 50 years ago, it was hard to get to years ago. It was hard to get to Europe from sub-Saharan Africa. Today, travel is cheaper and easier than it's ever been. And everybody knows how other people in the world are living. I mean, that's one of the things that these devices we all have, we've underestimated. Everywhere I go in the world, you know, you, you, you mean the poorest township in South Africa, most everyone's got a device in their hands mm-hmm. and they can see if it's a life that we might not regard as being great ourselves. It's, it's a lot better than a lot of the world. So I think in general, the liberal democracies, the capitalist countries, we've vastly underestimated our appeal and the number of people who want to come here. And if we don't have a sensible policy about this, this century is going to be a real problem. Well, let me let me ask this, right? And I'm willing to pay you $250,000. It doesn't work at scale. That's my view. I mean, it should, it should be able to work, but it doesn't at the moment. Um, the work you would put in to research somebody for a major position in your company is simply not the work that any government can do about the number of people coming into a country like America at the moment. Um, Most people think the size of the state is a little bloated at the moment. Can you imagine how much bigger the state would have to be to do that kind of background research on everyone walking across the southern border? I don't think you could do it. So, okay, so he's with the EU uh, parliament two-term and he's with the Polish, Poland parliament two-terms. That's who he is. Maybe you recognize the face. Yeah, yeah. Kathy Newman. Of yes, it was. It was with Kathy Newman. She says, countries. why? In the U.S. we can. You're saying in Europe, most countries Europe, you can't. Most countries you're not allowed why to. Why is that, that considered because what? Like the, discrimination? The, the, the facts would be what Kathy Newman would call racist. I mean, for instance, I was in Poland um, probably last about 18 months ago, and uh, they had a huge influx, of course, of Ukrainian, um, Ukrainian women mm-hmm. primarily uh, since the beginning of the, the war. Um, now, it's, I can't remember how, how many it is. It's more than a million, maybe two million, I think. Uh, that's a lot of people for a relatively small country, well, relatively small by American standards, country like Poland to deal with. How is it not led to, I don't know, suicide bombings, outbreaks of rapes and so, so on and so forth? Because Ukraine to Poland is not that big of a leap in cultural terms. They are their neighbors and they, the Poles know that this could happen to them and uh, they'd hope that if this happened to them, their neighbors would help them. That's quite different to say Sweden taking in large numbers of people from Somalia because we know that, I mean, Somalia, which has had terrible, terrible civil wars and violence for many years now, and this is not the fault of the people in that benighted country, but it's inevitable that if a large number of people from Somalia particularly young men, land in your country, they will bring a certain level of violence, which the Ukrainian women moving into Poland will not bring. Now, that's common sense, but it's also it's also difficult. Um, and and, and the, the desire, as um, Kathy Newman uh, shows there, to simply say, well, that's racist, or the facts are racist is overwhelming, and at the moment that still works in terms of shutting down any of this any of this discussion. I mean, I always say there are three things with only three things with immigration that really matter: um, speed, numbers, and identity. Speed, numbers, and identity. You can integrate. You c- can integrate large numbers of people relatively fast if the identity is pretty close. You can integrate a small number of people with a very different identity if it's a small number and the speed is slow. The very different identity, you've got not got a hope. 
of integrating. You just not got a hope. Why would they? They can live in communities with other people who are like them, and uh, they they don't need to be part of your society. And if you have no no punishment, as it were, for for not integrating, then yeah, there's no incentive. And and, and one other thing. So you remember what we're dealing with in the 21st century is a lot of people leaving very benighted countries where the standard of living is just horrific by our standards in general, you know, even, you know, particularly with the welfare state, you can have a much better standard of living than you could dream of in the country you've been from, you've come from. Uh, we don't know what to do about that. We just don't know what to do about it. We, America in particular, but Western Europe as well, is, is too attractive. A, uh, a, a building can be too attractive, but, you know, only one family gets to buy it and live in it. You know, sure. so we, we can we can do that part and allow certain people to come in. But again, the background goes to finding a way. Paid their way in it. And you can argue uh, that the, a lot of the university education system in the West is a sort of money making scheme. There are a lot of universities that just make money from foreign students charge them absolute top whack and uh, they don't care so how do you, how do you score well if you if you take oh well there's one for you. i'd like to see how you break that one down 50.3 like where it's at um take the uk census that happens every 10 years the last one um was eked out bit by bit because um uh, the authorities were rather worried that the public would um, leap to certain conclusions about the data. So the data had to be... Um, Rob, I just send it to you, Rob. If you can... Patient crisis I wrote about in Strange Death of Europe. Yeah. So this one, number one, Germany was number one, hmm. 4.76 million, if you want to zoom in. France is second, 4.71. You know, it, 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 if if you see the numbers, is there a panel? I guess you wouldn't be able to pull that off if you can't specify. Why wouldn't you want to do that? <laughs> because then you might get some results you don't want. I mean, for instance, why don't we have crime stats for Germany, for instance, which is one of the countries that have taken the largest number of migrants in the last decade? There's no crime stats. Who thinks that's a good idea? Do, do it for France. That's a really interesting one. Crime France stats for France. Okay. Are you trying to tell me that no one on the conservative side has the brass or the ability to get in there and find ways to get the data, not even independently research organizations? It's extremely hard to do. I mean, there are there are a, a groups, I mean, Migration Watch in the UK has tried to do some of it. You can't collect, it's very hard to collect cr crime stats, particularly when, as in most countries on the continent, the identities of the um, of the accused are kind of hidden from the public. There's a ten, there's a trend in, uh, in the reporting, for instance, in Germany of any crime that you don't give the name of the person. You do um, first name and then... A letter. Same thing in the Netherlands. Now, of course, you can tell a certain amount quite from the first name. By the way, this is well. Well, let's just linger on this for a second. Um, there is a reason for this. Is my point. There's a reason why you can't drill down into this. Look at um, if you. I don't know if you want to do one that's been very controversial and um, very obvious in recent years, which is the increase in rapes in Sweden. Uh, this is an enormously toxic issue. Um, there you go. Uh, I don't know whether it's increased from 21. Uh, increased nearly 20. It went up for, from 16,000 to 24,000. Um, by the way, I mean, this is in an area which people should really... A lot of women don't feel able to come forward. You should have a society in which people are willing to come forward. And you should have a society in which when an increase in rape happens or sexual assault, the society worries about it because something's going wrong. For instance, if it's that the men who are already in the society are suddenly really getting into raping, you would want to find out what was causing them to do that. But it's possible that that's not the explanation. But you can't really know because we don't have data, it won't be collected, and it probably never will be. Who in the right mind think that's a good idea? Countries. We don't even have numbers. We round to the nearest million on illegals in relatively small countries. To millions? We round to millions in countries about illegals. The About the best... Uh, uh, most reliable data you can get on, I think, any Western country on this is the census that happens every 10 years in the UK. Even that uh, is not that easy to trust because it's massively underreporting people in very high density immigrant areas who I do not believe in their entirety respond to the form from the US data authorities, the UK data authorities that comes every 10 years. Um, I'm just pointing out that this is just information we don't have. And when you say, well, why wouldn't we have that data? I'm saying because the data could be dangerous. It could be dangerous for the society. It would be um, it would be used by some bad people for sure in a bad way. There would definitely be bigots and racists and pot stirrers who would, you know, as with all dangerous things, pick it up and run with it. 
He might also say it's the right of the public to know, but uh, my view is that for a long time the view has been the public can't be trusted with the facts, so don't give them the facts. Public facts, so don't give them the facts. Why? If you give it to them, what do they do with it? They we make don't, the we channel- don't need, I, I made this point after the recent riots in Britain. I said, when you have mass legal and illegal migration at this speed and at this rate and with people from such a different identity, yeah. one of the things you do is you move a very, what was a very high trust society into a very low trust society. Okay. And that can happen from stats like this, or it can simply happen on who do you give a pound to when they're begging on the streets. So if I look at this here, number of illegal crossings between border crossings, this is the one I just sent, in the EU from 2009 to 2020. So on, I followed all this firsthand. I saw it all. I saw the boats all coming in, and uh, the authorities greeted the boats and helped them in. And um, it was... Partly, I mean, there was partly a humanitarian catastrophe, of course, coming from the Syrian civil war. But um, the beginning, it was we should allow in Syrian refugees, which there's an argument for, for sure. But very soon, as I saw with my own eyes, people were coming from all over Africa, the Middle East, the Far East. I met people who's uh, who were from uh, Asia, who you know, from relatively well-off backgrounds, but they saw that the borders were open and so they, they came. And, and they're, they're, of course, they're still in Europe. None of them have been removed. Okay, let me ask you crazy. What, the entire Jewish community in the UK? No, worldwide. Oh, worldwide. Yeah. Well, in the British government, I thought. I mean, if you take out the Israeli government because they've got an, all the benefits of a state, but uh, sure, I mean, the, the British government is a... Okay, who is... Fifth the largest economy in the world, so... So, British, so fifth largest, right? Mm-hmm. Until the, the Shah falls, sure. Iran's been a mess for 45 years since the two powers Powerful and they wanted to kind of, uh, you know, cause a fall. And this was their way of saying, here you go. I think we might have a disagreement of the history of uh, um, the Shah's fall and of indeed the Romanov's fall. Uh, I don't think anyone orchestrated that, as it were. Revolutions happen. Uh, just like I said, I wish that the plane so had not. Th- you don't think anybody well, was involved on, in the fall on. of Iran? No, no, hang on. Um, just as uh, I said, that I wish that the plane had not taken off from Paris with Khomeini sure. on it and landed safely. I, I wish that the, the train had not left the Finland station. Uh, carrying Lenin. Um, It was a very big mistake to allow Lenin, obviously, to get back uh, to Russia. Mm -hmm. Uh, A historic mistake. I I mean, there is always a simple uh, explanation of history, which is that somebody is guiding it. And that is, and I don't, generally speaking, I don't believe that. I might just, as a historian, having written about very complicated events in the past, my observation is, you know, would that there were a guiding hand that was able to do everything, but that there isn't. In fact, I don't want that to be, but there just isn't. There is no one force that's capable of doing something like that. Um, the Romanovs had problems that have been growing for two centuries, at least. Um, the Shah had problems that have been growing for decades. And then they meet the revolutionary force of somebody as evil mm-hmm. as Lenin or Khomeini. Mm-hmm. And as you know, I mean, both of these men were, I mean, they were death forces, but they were, they were forces of nature, a kind of extraordinary evil men, but they had followings and they could get people to follow them and they could do these terrible things and turn over a whole country and a civilization. They were able to do that. Anyone in Washington, D.C. or I mean, really? Yeah, I don't. I mean, I mean, there's, of course, there's always an argument about Mossadegh earlier on. Um, but no, I mean, I think it's consoling to people. I think I think there's a consolation to to thinking that when these things happen, they happen because somebody, always in the West, by the way, orchestrated that to happen. I think it's a thing of consolation. For instance, if the West access to Iranian oil supplies (laughs) wasn't a good idea to let Khomeini in. Um, If uh, people thought that the Romanovs were a problem, who on earth would have thought the Bolsheviks were the solution? Churchill famously said that this was like allowing a bacillus to be released in the society. Um, But uh, going back to what you ask about Europe, um, again, I mean, when you say where power resides, I mean, power resides in lots of different places. And it, it oscillates. Sometimes a parliament, for instance, has a lot of power. Sometimes a single member of parliament has a lot of power. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes a parliament doesn't have power. Sometimes, like in the age of social media, social media has power and overtakes the power of politicians and politicians have to cower from the social media. At other times, it's the other way around to legislation from government. So th- th- there's never yeah. a fixed, I don't think you there's don't ever think a fixed... that's a naive way of thinking? Well, uh, I'm having this conversation with you because I'm curious to know how you process this part. Because solution, l- way of thinking, very low resolution. Unpack yeah. that for me. 
Um, I think that, again, it comes down to the nature of the world being extremely complex always, much more complex in this era where we get insight into things we would never have got insight into before, the ability of, on our devices to find out information we would never have been allowed to find out before, and to hear opinions we could never have heard before. Um, there is, in my view, a uh, temptation, there are many temptations in this era, but one of them is to see um, specific guiding hands in certain places because it is a consolation to us to help us through what otherwise looks like something too close to chaos. Let me just take one of the words you use, establishment. Do I believe there is an establishment? No, there are lots of establishments. Lots. There are financial establishments, for sure. There are political establishments, for sure. There's a Democrat establishment there's a republican establishment there are different establishments within For each sure, of these parties but what i'm talking about but the about... idea and no, but when, so just when you say the, an establishment i want to like which one what who I'll, are we talking I'll, about I'll do we think that you. do we think that donald trump and bill clinton get together with bill gates and agree on anything no no i don't think that's the community uh, C-suite ex uh, establishment. I've, yeah, I've been around. Could, there are two. Th there, there, I mean, there, there are many ways to look at it. But 